Medieval England was a superpower of the Middle Ages. Being conveniently situated on the northwestern outskirts of Europe, a land surrounded by sea, with only a few like-minded neighbours such as Wales and Scotland. Medieval England had an almost perfect opportunity to thrive. With an ideal farming environment, carefully constructed trade routes, and powerful leaders led the population of England to build beautiful medieval towns and cities, rich in culture, religion, trade and innovation. These cities would go on to lead the way in which England would put its foot down as a medieval military monster. A force to be reckoned with throughout Middle Age Europe. However, the story of England as a powerful land of plenty dates back far beyond the medieval age. In fact, to begin our deep dive of medieval England, we have to go back, way back to 3000 BC and the end of Britain's Neolithic Age. Now, covering the entirety of England's history, spanning over 5,000 years, is obviously going to take a whole new age just to talk about. So, to give you a little slice of England's rich history, instead, I'm going to take you on a little journey through the history of one of medieval England's most prolific towns, and then cities, and also my personal home, Norwich. Norwich is a city in Norfolk, Eastern England, commonly known as the capital of East Anglia. It is the largest city of East Anglia. Now, East Anglia being a collective term for the two counties, Norfolk and Suffolk. And yes, the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk do literally mean the North Folk and, you guessed it, the South Folk. And yes, I know that sounds like it was directly taken from a Tolkien book about hobbits and shires and rings. And to anyone who is watching this video who have never visited England before, yes, England is exactly like Lord of the Rings in every single way. Hands off our dragons, they're ours. Anyway. Norwich's story begins, actually, not in Norwich at all, because in the Neolithic Age of Britain, Norwich won't have been born for another 4,000 years. Instead, we begin our story in Thetford, Suffolk. In around 3000 BC, just north of Thetford Forest, laid an area of land rich in flint. Flint is a stone which was commonly used by the Neolithic people, due to its adaptable capabilities. Flint could also be fashioned into axe heads, spear heads, arrow heads, as well as being used to scrape animal fat and skin off furry hides to be used for clothing. During the end of the Neolithic Age, the Neolithic people of Norfolk and Suffolk began to bore holes into the ground, digging through the soil and chalk to reach the flint stone underneath. These ancient miners would use primitive tools such as pickaxes made from deer antlers and crude wooden ladders to delve deeper and deeper into the ground. 433 mine shafts were dug into the tough chalk, and the largest of which being over 14 metres deep. Archaeologists calculate that over 2,000 tonnes of chalk had been removed from the ground to construct these mines as they dug their way through the various levels of stone to reach their desired floor stone level, which was judged as the best flint for tool making. It is estimated that these ancient mine shafts could have produced around 16 to 18,000 tonnes of flint, most of which were traded to other Neolithic people across Britain and beyond. Yes, that is right, even 5,000 years ago, these mainly hunter-gatherer people traded amongst each other, an action which was key to the future of Norwich's success. These complexes of mines were later named Grimes Graves by the Anglo-Saxons who later rediscovered the landscape, named after the Saxon god Grim, meaning the masked one. Grimsgraben was also another name the Anglo-Saxons called this place, 
which translated roughly means the Masked One's Quarry. Grimes Graves wasn't the only Neolithic site of importance in the East Anglia area. There has also been many signs of Neolithic human activity around Norfolk and Suffolk, such as barrows, springs, carns, and standing stones. Arguably, the most important of which, and intriguing, lies just to the south of where Norwich stands today. On a field on the southern side of the River Tass, lays possibly the most important, yet almost unknown, Neolithic site in Norfolk. In 1929, a bizarre earthwork was reported in the fields just north of the village of Arminghall by a pilot. Photographs were taken which confirmed two concentric rings visible from the air. There also appeared to be some sort of internal feature at the centre of the rings. In 1935, Excavation of the area was granted, led by the Norfolk Research Committee, which unveiled a Neolithic henge, some 82 metres in diameter. A henge is a circular prehistoric monument constructed of earth, stone and wood. The henge consisted of two horseshoe-shaped ditches, with a bank leading up to the central circle, in which eight wooden posts were discovered. Tests on charcoal found on one of the post holes dated the area to be at least 4,500 years old. A number of hand-worked flints and pottery also confirmed the site to date to at least 2,500 BC. I'm sure you've all heard of the famous Stonehenge near Amesbury. Well, the Woodhenge of Arminghall would have been built around the same time. In fact, there is a surprising number of finds at the Arminghall Woodhenge, consisting of Bronze Age pottery, Iron Age pottery, and even Roman pottery, as well as Roman coins. This means that, just like its big brother, Stonehenge, the Arminghall Woodhenge was a place of great importance for humans for over 2,500 years consecutively. Currently, no further archaeological digs have been done on Arminghall Woodhenge, and its secrets still remain a mystery. Moving forward a few thousand years, and we arrive at the height of the Iron Age, which took place in Britain from around 800 BC to 43 AD. The Iron Age brought some interesting changes to the Norfolk landscape, most notably the construction of hill forts. Hill forts are large, usually circular earthworks, built specifically for defence. They tend to consist of two or more concentric rings, with gaps to place a ramp for the main entrance, much like a grander version of the Bronze Age henges that I previously mentioned. Although, whereas the henges were primarily places of worship, hill forts held small villages where people would live, keep livestock, trade, and build things. These hill forts would include everything a tribe would need to survive, with a wooden palisade wall encircling the village, a wooden gatehouse, and places of worship, such as shrines, all in one place. Farmlands would stretch around the outside of a fort, covering the local countryside. Most hill forts can be found in southern England, particularly Devon, Dorset, and Cornwall. However, Norfolk has five main hill forts that we are currently aware of. Holcombe, Fetford, Tavesborough, Bloodgate Hill, and the most impressive one, Warham. Warham is a perfect example of a typical Iron Age hill fort, situated near the North Norfolk coast, just north of Norwich. Made from soil and chalk landscape, and 212 metres in diameter, Warham is the best preserved hill fort in Norfolk. Seeing it in person really gives you a sense of the sheer labour that would have gone into building such a large earthwork, and I'm sure it would have felt very homely and safe. With the wooden walls around the circumference, and living in such close quarters to your neighbours, there must have been a real sense of community when living in a hill fort. In fact, 
Warham has a bit more history to it than the other hill forts, as it is said to be Boudicca's home before the rebellion against the Romans. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. This was supposed to be a video about the city of Norwich, and so far I've talked about flint mines, wood henges, and hill forts. No mention of Norwich yet. Well, don't worry, it's coming. I just want you to get a feel of the general area of Norfolk first, understanding how the landscape evolved and the places of significant importance, and the people who stayed in Norfolk before the city came to be. We've discussed Norfolk during the Neolithic Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and now let's talk about Norfolk during the Roman Age. The Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD under the reign of Emperor Claudius, although Julius Caesar had gone on an expedition around Britain in 55 BC, mainly as a reconnaissance mission and to establish trade rights. But with the power of Emperor Claudius, and an army, the Romans had come back to stay. By 87 AD, the majority of Britain had come under Roman rule, with the exception of Scotland, who had been proven too difficult to negotiate with, and weren't regarded as worth the effort by the Romans anyway, which led to the construction of Hadrian's Wall, and later, the Antonine Wall. I should probably mention that Norfolk wasn't actually called Norfolk during this time, but it was called Iceni, named after the Celtic Iceni tribe who lived there. Initially, the Iceni remained to live independently from the Romans, despite the Roman Empire claiming most of England by this time. However, the Iceni king, Prasutagus, had made plans to incorporate the Roman lifestyle within the Iceni. Prasutagus's wife, Boudicca, did not feel the same way. This was mainly due to the fact that Roman laws at the time meant that only male heirs could inherit power, so when the Iceni king died in 60 AD, the Romans swooped in to claim the land of the Iceni. Boudicca resisted and sparked a rebellion, sacking the Roman towns of Colchester, London and St Albans. The Roman powerhouse soon reacted and crushed the rebellion, defeating Boudicca's forces at the Battle of Watling Street in 61 AD, and inevitably amalgamating the Roman lifestyle into the lives of the Iceni people at last. It is said that the Emperor Nero was so shaken by the events that he considered withdrawing from Britain altogether, but with the revolt brought to a decisive end, the occupation of Britain continued. In an effort to prove that the Roman lifestyle was worth turning to, the Romans built a large town for the Iceni people, hoping that they would leave their outdated wooden hill forts to enjoy the comforts of Roman stone and tile houses. This town was called Venta Icenorum, meaning marketplace of the Iceni. It has also later gained the name Caister, now known as Caister St Edmunds. Large ditches, stone walls and gatehouses surrounded the town bringing much better defence and security than the previous wooden palisades of the hill forts. Back in Roman times, the River Tass, which meanders close to Venturisnorum, used to be a wide estuary which flowed east into the North Sea. At the mouth of the estuary, you can find Bure Castle, a Roman fortified port. However, Bure Castle wasn't its original name. It isn't perfectly clear, but the Roman name may have been Garianonum. The name Bure Castle stems from a Saxon monastery called Nobhisbra, which was later built on the site. The Normans then built a wooden Mott and Bailey castle within the Roman walls, making efficient use of the pre-existing defences as the Normans often did with Roman sites. Some other most notable examples would be Porchester and Pevensey. Bure Castle was one of two Roman forts on the East Norfolk coastline, the other one being a little further down the coast, named Caister on Sea. They were built to defend merchant ships and farmland against the early Saxon raiders, and were the main protection of Venturisnorum. 
due to the collapse of the Roman Empire in around 476 AD. The Romans in Britain were cut off from the European Roman protection, and so became the Romano-British. Over time, the Romans in Britain slowly became more domesticated, rather than militarised, and put down their gladius in exchange for the pitchfork and became primarily farmers. The collapse of the Roman Empire meant that the fractured settlements were now up for grabs by anyone looking to seek them out and take the risk. Britain was now in the crosshairs of many eager raiders, the most notable of which were the Saxons. The Saxons had been raiding Britain for over a century, but were continuously beaten back by the Roman defenders. However now, with no powerhouse to back them up, the Romano-British were vulnerable and on their own. Germanic and Danish raiders got in their boats and sailed across the English Channel and began taking over villages and towns one by one. The main raiding tribes were the Jutes, Angles and the Saxons. The Angles and the Saxons formed an alliance and soon became the new occupier of Britain. They named themselves the Anglo-Saxons. Which, as I mentioned in a previous video, is where we get the name England from, derived from the name Angleland. So, the Anglo-Saxons were now the new owners of England, which meant that Norfolk had a new owner as well. And what did the Saxons do when they marched up to Venturisnorum and saw the beautiful stone and tile walled town left by the Romans? They left it alone and built wooden homes on the other side of a river. The Saxons really detested the Romans, so much due to their occupancy of Europe and the zero-tolerance approach to the practice of paganism, that they refused to live in the homes built by the Romans, despite how much better they were. Saxon villages cropped up around several Norfolk locations, such as Blowfield and Fakenham. But something was in the works, something big. The Saxons didn't want to live in a town built by the Romans, but they were okay with using their stone to build a town of their own. The Saxons began pulling down the Roman buildings, then travelled a few miles north and began building three settlements next to each other near a river. The town of Northwick, on the north side of the River Wensum, Westwick, and later, Thorpe. And so, as we know it, Norwich was born. Due to Norfolk being somewhat out of the way in the east of England, it mostly kept out of conflicts that occurred between the Saxon kingdoms of Mercia, Wessex, Northumbria and others, and instead became a thriving marketplace. The market square of Tombland was erected and the evidence of pottery and coins have been found, suggesting that Norwich had traded with Germanic and other European kingdoms as well as Anglo-Saxon kingdoms within Britain. By the 11th century, the town of Norwich had become an important centre of trade and commerce, and had largely managed to avoid the continuous Viking raids around the north of England. Despite this, East Anglia was an area favoured by the Vikings, however more so as a place for settlement and trade, rather than raiding and bloodshed. The Nordic people who settled here became Anglo-Scandinavians, and had converted to Christianity by this point, much as the Saxons had a few centuries earlier. But in 1004 AD, Swine Forkbeard, the Viking King of Denmark, led his Viking longboats up for Wensum River, and raided the town of Norwich, burning much of it to the ground. Norwich was soon rebuilt and again established itself as an important trading town. The year is 1066 AD. 
the Normans have landed on the shores of southern England. The Saxon king, Harold Godwinson, is dead. The Normans are marching north, assuming control of every village and town they pass through. William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy, is crowned King of England on Christmas Day, 1066. The new King of England took a shine to Norfolk, describing it as a land of profound peace and tranquillity. William looked at Norwich and, again, saw great opportunity. In 1067 AD, he ordered the demolition of 98 Saxon homes to make way for a castle, a large Motton Bailey castle with a big dry ditch encircling the steep mound for extra defence. Excavation of Norwich Castle's mound discovered that the castle was built on top of a Saxon cemetery, no doubt something that William had purposely ordered to show his disgust for the Saxon people. There is also a story of King William asking the Saxon residents to help build up the castle mound for him, and when they refused, William grinned, saying, You'll help me build the mound, one way or another, before ordering his men to kill the villagers who declined his invitation, and threw their bodies into the mound. The castle was, at first, of wooden construction, however King William liked Norfolk so much that he planned to retire there, ordering the castle to become his palace using stone imported from Cayenne in France to show off his endless wealth. However, William never lived to see his palace completed, as he died in 1087 AD. He had only stayed in Norwich Castle once during his reign. The stone keep was completed sometime between 1095 AD and 1110 AD, and despite no longer becoming King William's palace, it still remained as a royal castle with its spectacular Norman arches adorning both the interior and the exterior. While the construction of Norwich Castle was nearing completion, a new project in Norwich became underway. A cathedral, again made from cayenne stone from France, was built on the ground of a pre-existing Saxon church. You can still see the four corners of where the church would have been, due to the four pillars situated in the west end consisting of a different pattern to the rest of them. To anyone watching this video who is a Norwich local, I'll let you see if you can find these four columns, and leave a comment below if you find them. The cathedral, with its 96 metre tall spire, is the second tallest cathedral in England, and has a very interesting history through the years. In fact, I may make a dedicated video of Norwich Cathedral, as it's a magical place to visit. Under Norman rule, Norwich continued to thrive as a bustling city of trade, becoming one of the largest and wealthiest cities in England, with woolen textiles being its primary commodity. With the construction of Norwich Cathedral complete, the city also became a huge religious sector, boasting 57 churches, 31 of which still existing, the most churches of any medieval city in the world. Medieval Norwich also had three friaries, namely White Friars, Grey Friars, and, a bit of a theme here, Black Friars. Only a road name remains of Grey Friars, a sunken arch and a part of wall remains of White Friars, but due to Black Friars being turned into a hall and university of Norwich Arts, a great deal of the original religious building remains, including half of its cloisters. So, one cathedral, three friaries, and 57 churches must be enough to prove that the people of Norwich like God, surely. Let's throw in an abbey and a priory as well, shall we? Now in the private hands of Coleman's Mustard, Carrow Abbey was founded in 1146 by Benedictine nuns, and St. Leonard's Priory was built in 1094 on the hill of Ketz Heights, overlooking the city of Norwich, to provide accommodation for monks while the cathedral was being built. Okay, so, a castle, a cathedral, one abbey, one priory, three friaries, and 57 churches. What else could Norwich City possibly hold? Well, how about a huge stone wall complete with five stone gatehouses? The entirety of medieval Norwich City was surrounded by a large flintstone wall 
complete with five stone gatehouses and many artillery towers, the most famous of which is Cow Tower and the Black Tower. None of the five gatehouses survive today as they were all demolished to make way for the expanding of the city after the medieval period, but there is a river gate which can still be seen today. This river gate was called Devil's Gate and was near Carrow Abbey, which consists of two stone towers either side of the river, which would have had an iron chain running between them over the river Wensum to stop any unwanted ships from entering the sea. Medieval river gates are extremely rare to be preserved in the modern world, and the Devil's Gate is one of the only river gates in England that survive today. Technically, there are actually seven gatehouses in medieval Norwich, excluding the gatehouses within the walls of Norwich Castle, of course. The other two gatehouses are the Ethelbert and the Erpingham gatehouses. These beautifully decorated gatehouses give access to the cathedral close from Tombland. I'll talk more about these two gates in another video, because they have a very interesting history to do with Norwich Cathedral. And so, there we have it. An introduction to the origins of medieval Norwich. The city has far too much history to cover in just one video, as there are just too many places of interest within these city walls. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe, and check out my Instagram as it's full of my own photography of historical places around Britain and elsewhere. For now, thanks for watching.